Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Deborah Jackson, founder and CEO, Plum Alley. Hi there. Um, I would like my fellow panelists to come out. First, we're going to have Sean Abramson, who is the co founder and managing partner of Urban.us. And Susan Beeler, a principal at Catalyst Partners. And Joshua Kaufman, who is the founder of Wisdom VC. And finally, Shauna Fisher, a managing partner at Third Kind Ventures Capital. Shauna, we're going to do a switcheroo. That's okay. They, they <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, so this is a really great panel because what we have here is a number of uh, venture capitalists and funders for innovation. And it's always good to hear from people who are writing the checks and giving the gasoline in the engine to create a lot of the innovation that we see in the world. So we're going to start off, jump into this right away. Um, and I'm going to ask each one of the panelists to do a very brief introduction about who they are and what types of things they're funding that relate to cities. And not, not a commercial about their fund or their firm, but more importantly, what are their observations? What do they see going on? And we're going to get started with that. And then we have some um, provocative questions that I will ask them. So first, first up. Um, Joshua Kaufman. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm from wisdom.vc. That's the URL, wisdom.vc. We are a multi-industry, multi-sector, multi-stage investment outfit. So we do everything from pre-seed to post-D, checks from 250,000 to above 3 million. In the city space specifically, what we're looking at is city economics being more relevant and salient and ultimately more interesting for venture capitalists than, say, national economics. And so we're playing a lot with cities because we think that there's an enormous amount of growth in thinking about cities from scratch. In terms of the cities that we like to think about, we're spending a lot of time in the developing world because that's where the majority of future cities are going to be. 95% of people who are going to be new to cities, that's people who are as yet to be born to the planet Earth, as well as those people who have yet to live in cities, they're going to be coming to cities in the developing world on the fringes of informal settlements. So we're spending a lot of time in Africa. We're going to India in two weeks in order to look at a series of urban service delivery. Uh, and that's the kind of city that we're looking at. So it's a totally globe-spanning approach. Um, hi, Susan from Catalyst. Uh, we're a growth equity firm based in New York. And we focus on investing in technology and communication companies. So we invest. We're a little bit later stage, so we invest about 20 to 50 million in any single portfolio company. Um, the companies have to be over 10 million of run rate revenue. So usually that's about a series B or C round. And in terms of our focus, uh, when it has to do with cities, is that we focus on the infrastructure that allows growth in those cities. So I've been hearing a lot about um, connectivity and data at this conference. So a lot of communication infrastructure, spectrum wireless towers, data centers, and then the applications that sit on top of that. So a lot of software companies that allow you know, ease of use and convenience through our daily lives. So anything in that field, um, it would be something that we're interested in. Oh, hi, um, Sean Abramson. Um, I'm the managing partner of a venture fund called Urban Us. A lot of people think .us stands for United States. Actually, is us, um, just in case there's any confusion, collective. Um, so we invest in companies that make city life better. And we start off thinking about that around sort of two big ideas. One is cities are already 70% of emissions. If you look at growth of cities, cities are effectively climate change. So if we don't redesign or rethink the way we build and operate cities, um, we don't solve climate change, uh, which has some bad affects all of us. Um, and so the other thing that we think about is cities and density are actually awesome in lots of ways. The problem is that as cities get more dense, 
Um, for all the good stuff that you get, you get a lot of negative things like traffic, uh, public health issues, crime. And so we invest in that category of things that make uh, more of the uh, good things associated with density, density possible and negate some of the negative things. Uh, Shanna Fisher, and I focus on very early stage companies, uh, super seed. Um, I, they're very thematic in my investing, uh, so the themes are always changing. Uh, with, with regard to cities, I think one thing uh, I'm focused on is generational changes that may be uh, if, I impacting themes because of the people making them are a new generation or impact uh, sections of, the, of, of a generational change. And that is uh, something I'm focused on right now. Great, thank you. So um, many, all of you um, see opportunities and companies and innovation every day. That is your day job. So when you're looking at companies and opportunities, how do you factor in how this might affect a city or work in a city? Because I know many times you see um, you know, opportunities and, and, and just think of like driverless cars and things that are being created and innovated out in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. And they're kind of being you know, built and, and uh, brought forward in a bit of a vacuum. And then, of course, when they come to cities and hit the streets of the city and there's regulation and pushback by the local governments and a lot of um, things that people really hadn't thought about in terms of how that might affect parking lots or revenue that comes into the city from parking tickets. And, you know, there's any innovation or anything new when it's introduced in its real place will have massive implications. So as a funder, when you see opportunities and innovation, how do you factor in how that will work in a city or what are the implications to the city? I'll start. Uh, I think of a few things, first of all. Who's the customer? A lot of city-based companies say that they're smart city ventures because they happen to have customers who live in cities. Well, that turns out that most of us live in cities, and so therefore most companies are city companies. So we try to get to the bottom of who the actual customer is. Is the city the customer, or is the customer somebody who happens to be living in a city? Uh, that's the first dimension of it. The second dimension that we like to look at is that we operate with an actual model of what we think a utopian city is. We have a very clear idea inside of Wisdom VC of how cities ought to be. And we map out the venture opportunities that come to us against what that city is. And it turns out our model does not include self-driving cars. Sure, they're going to be there in our future utopian city, but we have to separate the propaganda from large-scale technology companies and the kinds of products that they're trying to push forward versus the types of technologies that are actually available. And I'll give you just a really basic example of something. Watershed moment for me yesterday here at the conference, I got a tour of the Newtown water treatment plant. They produce every single day 3 million cubic feet of methane. This is an amazingly valuable fuel. What do they do with it? They just burn it. Because they haven't figured out a way to actually monetize that. People who are in the petroleum business here would recognize that as an amazing business opportunity and we can make a circular city starting with stuff that we have. The waste that we're already getting rid of. Not to mention the 200 million gallons of waste that go into the water there every day that we don't treat that can be turned into fertilizer. These are the kinds of business opportunities that we're looking at. We're looking at the circular economy rather than looking towards self-driving vehicles and data and all the other things that can be construed as uh, large-scale products pushed by the obvious companies. Shanna, do you have some thoughts on that? Sure. I, I like to use my perspective of living in a city to think about some of these issues. Certainly many of my investments are in Silicon Valley and I do appreciate the culture there to create new things and original ideas and the talent. But I think that sometimes the tendency is to simplify how the world will be with these technologies in it. So for example, even the common wisdom now, self-driving cars will enable no parking lots and everything will change and, and I think that, that one of the things you learn living in a city is that the, the, the complexities 
of what the impact of some of these technologies are so unknown. So I like to think about those complexities and the opportunities within them. For example, uh, I do have a self-driving car in, uh, you know, investment, but I start to think about you know, the t today's version of a self-driving car. You get into a car service, it's kind of a self-driving car. You know, they, the Waze tells them where to go. You don't talk to the person. It's kind of like that. So what is happening today that's gonna be an indication of how it might be when they are automated? One thing I love to think about, about living in a city, the populations of living in a city bring up a family in a city. Those have all grown in the last, really just 10 years. It used to be when people had a family, they moved out of the city. Why? Because the women, woman didn't work. So it wasn't practical to stay in the city. But now that they work, working women, they stay in the city. So because it's much more practical if you have a job, you need to be near the school, near the doctor, et cetera, you stay in the city. So how are, how are the self-driving cars gonna impact that and impact even more people coming and living in cities? Because it's much, much more practical. That's where you work. I think the, the looking at the impact of things like that, so many successful companies today are actual be, actually because the women in cities work. So Amazon, I mean, just look, look at any of the businesses that are thriving today. Many of them is because the person who's doing the purchasing is the worker, it's also the woman. So I think the, so many complexities come out of these technologies that are unknown. And it's not so simple to say, oh, no parking lots. There might be parking lots, because families that are very wealthy, which is what happens in cities, these incredible wealth divides, they, they, they may have their own self-driving car just for their unit, and they have to park somewhere. So it's, it's not so simple to be like zero sum for some of this stuff, you know? Yeah. Susan. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, when we, whenever we make an investment, right, we're, we're a little bit luckier in that respect. The companies are a later stage, so you're not, you're not dealing with, oh my gosh, are we going to start this thing and then some issue is going to come up or that the whole thing's going to, we're going to lose all of our money, right? Like we typically will invest in companies at that mark where they've already established a solid biz business model and they've already figured out the replications of their, their quality of their product and services and how it impacts, you know, the city that they're delivering that good in. So, you know, we typically focus on what's happening from the consumer behavior um, aspect. So, you know, one of our portfolio companies um, is MindBody. And I don't know if anyone here books, books classes through it. You know, if you do a yoga class, Pilates, fitness, they also um, enable the ability for ClassPass to work if you use that. But essentially, when we think about that, it's, it's more of how do people want to live now? How do people want to interact with their mobile device? And how do we want to you know, live our daily lives? I mean, right now, you wake up, you grab your phone, and you're attached to it. You, can you even imagine putting it down for a couple hours? I mean, people, you, you basically hail a cab with it now. You can, do, you can date people through your phone. You can order food. You can book dinner reservations. You can park. So everything that's, is, that you're, like, the ability to live in a city um, and have such resources through your phone is so great. So we look at sort of what customers are demanding, and um, they just, the cities are supporting such great infrastructures of these type of communities. So for MindBody, for example, right, you no longer have to call around or research, you know, 20 different websites to figure out what fitness class you want to go to. You have the MindBody Connect app, which allows you to do that in a very seamless way. So we always look at sort of quality of life and how it's going to affect consumers in that industry. So that's just one area we always look at. So Joshua, anything to add on that? Um, I'm going to be Joshua. You said oh, no, Joshua. You mean Sean? Okay. I'm to, I'm to, um, so I, I think you can we, add something to at the end. No, Thanks, <laughs> Sean. Um, so I think we look at a couple of things: uh, sort of technology, systems, and people. Um, believe it or not, the tech part is really easy. Like, there's a lot of history of how economics change with volume of things. Um, you know, it's sort of if you want to take Moore's law and apply it to lots of things. Some go faster, some go slower. But the tech part is easy. So we assume that that's going to have an impact, and it lets us do things that look like science fiction. So then the question is, assuming you can do science fiction, what system are you doing it, and how do you expect the system to respond? And mostly, the system is people. And if you can tell me how people are going to behave, I want to talk to you, because we generally don't know. So we assume that we're going to invest early. We're doing a research experiment. 
And the principal thing that we're testing for is how are the people going to respond when we propose something new, usually using technology that is probably very clunky and too expensive, but will be probably 10x better fairly quickly. And then interesting things happen. So for example, if you go into the real estate business and you start to think about incentives of people in construction, you know, what do construction people care about, right? Um, I, you know, so we invested in a commercial drone company, and it turns out that having drones fly around and tell you your sort of start points every day and relieve you of an hour of project management and setup, everyone liked that. No one liked that part of their job, so they were more than happy to have drones there. Very, very different when you use the drones to instruct robots on a site, because now you start interacting with people who are under threat and are not really interested in helping you decide how robotic uh, construction equipment is going to operate. And so we spend a lot of time just trying to think through what do we think people are going to do, um, whether it's business to business, whether it's people that are making procurement decisions in government. Um, often there's, there's politics, believe it or not. Um, and, and so as another, for example, like we find we have a bunch of companies that sell into government. Some of them actually sell procurement platforms. Some of them sell tools for law enforcement. One of the things that's become very interesting is politically right now, it's very easy to do anything related to safety. Right? You can get million dollar RFPs done like this. If you go into any other category of selling things into cities, good luck. Right? Be very, very patient. And, but that's all people. That has nothing to do with technology. Um, so that's our thesis. And the last thing that I'll say is we built out a network of people. So when we look at deals, we actually pitch 1,500 people. And all we're looking for is signal coming back in unexpected ways. Right? So we invested in a one-wheel skateboard, which shouldn't make any sense. The principal reason was we had a bunch of people that were biking to work who said, this would be cool if I could pick this thing up and get into an Uber versus worrying about what to do with my bike. Didn't occur to us, but that was what we were told. So um, we don't have to, that way we don't have to pretend to be smart. We just learn from other people. So I, I want to pick up on a few things. So one, one is, you mentioned it just really briefly, which is where do cities come from? Now we're in this four million square foot Brooklyn Navy Yard project. It's amazing. This came from a war, the Second World War, when this was the number one shipbuilding operation in the world. And so we have this legacy infrastructure. It turns out we have to rebuild a lot of our cities because they're outdated, they're falling apart. Uh, American infrastructure, we all know, got a D grade from the American Engineering Association. Uh, and a lot of new cities are being built. But in the last 40 years, productivity has not increased at all. Safety has not increased at all in the construction industry. Uh, this is a space we need to look at. But more broadly, we need to understand cities as entities that are increasingly discriminating against people. And here's what I mean by that. If you've been following news about cities of late, you'll notice that the suburbs are being, well, they're the ones that are suffering the most from inequality. Uh, they're the ones where, the, where you find the poverty right now in America. And it's the cities that are doing incredibly well. But as cities become more expensive, and to the extent that existing landholders and existing tax structures don't allow for those cities to increasingly densify, you actually prevent people from having the right to use the city in the same way that everybody else does. It doesn't sound like such a bad thing. Well, you've got to work really hard to get into a city. But it turns out that there's a lot of barriers to entry, and those barriers to entry are increasing in cities. And simultaneously, if you're in a city and you're doing well, you're going to geometrically do better than the people who aren't in a city. So we need to all focus on getting people to come into cities in order to find economic opportunities. And it echoes a pattern across corporate America right now. I talk to CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. They're concerned because they don't have customers anymore. They're like, our automation strategy has been so good that we could fire a whole bunch of people, but now we're starting to find out that there are no more customers for our products because our customers used to be our employees. It's kind of a similar arrangement that's happening right now with regard to the access to the city. So as you think about the kinds of companies that we're going to finance in cities, we also need to be incredibly aware of maintaining accessibility to cities for all the kinds of people who are looking for jobs or looking for communities or looking for overcoming loneliness by coming to cities. Joshua, I think that brings up an important point, which is um, when you look at innovation and new companies and where you're going to put your dollars and your potential returns, how are you thinking about the um, possibility of returns other than financial? Obviously, when you have funds and LPs, you've got to produce financial returns. But beyond that, 
are there any ways or any metrics you're using or what's your internal conversation that looks at things beyond the financial returns? We don't use the language of social impact, but we use things that are akin to it. Uh, if you look at something like a city like Copenhagen or Amsterdam that encourages bicycling over car traffic, you also get to see a linear relationship between the number of people biking and the healthcare costs for people in their old age. And so I kind of answered the question in financial terms, yeah. but it's a bit of a circuitous path as to how you get public health, for example, with bicycling or even planting trees to have long-term consequences on the expenditures of national governments or city governments on health. Yeah. So we are counting those into effect. Great. And other comments on that? Yeah, I mean, just on that, I mean, what we, we don't have a social impact component of our fund either where we're mandated to invest a certain percentage or a certain amount of capital into, into social impact, but we do focus on job creation. So the one thing I do love about being in VC and growth is that, you know, you're investing in companies, you're giving them capital to grow and to essentially hire people and build out their infrastructure. So. I think um, you know one of our partners is really involved with the NVCA, which um, focuses on this very thing. And I think they calculated that VCs contribute to three million jobs every year. So just by funding our companies, we're contributing to three million jobs. We did a, the same analysis on our portfolio, and I think we had headcount increase 25% year over year, um, which was pretty impressive. I mean, we invest in these companies; they're sub 100 employees typically. And then if you have you know, the great outcomes that we all expect, you can really build a lot of value there and impact the cities that you're in by providing jobs. And um, you know, I think by the time we look to invest, the, the companies that we've invested in have usually tripled in size and really been able to grow through the, you know, the great opportunities and employ employees that they've been able to hire. So whether it's, it's, it's sort of not directly related, but it's a really powerful impact that I think the VC community really can contribute to cities. And I have to say um, that every investment has impact. And I think there's been, you know, definitions and sort of branding around social impact. But when you really get down to it, there isn't an investment that doesn't have impact. It could be good or bad impact, or there are different ways to measure it, like employment created or uh, impact on the environment. But every single time you make an investment, either as a fund or as individuals, there is impact. And I think we're seeing, with, within our membership base, much more attention to that, yes. Go for financial returns, check that box, but let's look beyond that. And I think some people are really beginning to um, broaden that conversation because it is important. So anything to add on that? Let's just get the other can I, can I just jump in there? Not all dollars are created equally. I don't know if anybody's heard of the effective altruism movement. If you haven't heard of it, yeah. I highly recommend checking it out because all dollars are different. And so you do have impact in everything that you do, but the question is, how is the impact mapping against the thing that you're trying to optimize for? So we're looking at a deal right now in India that's called Janajal. Most of India lives with digestive distress and intermittency with regard to the access to clean water. That means you can't think straight. That means you're not feeling right. That means you might be sick chronically. This is a super high impact thing to bring clean water to Indians. It's a different kind of impact. Uh, Copenhagen Consensus was the originator of this kind of idea of, the, uh, of effective altruism. The question is, if you do have a dollar, where do you put it? And every fund has a different focus. Um, so check it out. Well, Sean, any, any additional comments on that or just how you and, I mean, and look I, at it? I, I think what we really struggled with, and I think Josh mentioned the same thing, is uh, in the first year that we started to work on Urbanus, we would talk about climate change. And 50% of the time, someone would take us to the side after we've had a meeting and said, you know, this is kind of cool. You should talk to our foundation. Or why are you talking about climate change? So we don't talk about it, right? But internally, that is our principal filter. Either you do things that help density, or you do things that directly impact emissions. If we can make that case, then we continue. Our belief is that the smartest people that we've met when we talk to our founders about hiring, those people do not only work for money. And so that's how our companies succeed. We get more talented people in general because most of the companies have a North Star that goes beyond multiples in a venture fund. And so, you know, this is, I mean, ultimately you land up debating fundamentally 
what is Western, um, uh, you know, free market economy, right? How much of it is free market and optimized for returns, and how much is optimized for a broader group of stakeholders? That debate's not going to go anywhere. We just think, um, you know, at the at this point, there's room for companies that have that probably generate relatively too much public good and a little less for shareholders. But the shareholders are going to be fine, right? And it's just a, a very interesting um, dynamic, though, that I see growing, which is, you know, when I judge competitions of early stage companies, and I'm on a panel like, like this one, and we'll see a number of companies, and we'll say, that's a great one, could make a 10x return or whatever. And then, you know, I'll frequently bring up the question, well, do we want this company in the world? And people will look at me like I have two heads, like, oh, hadn't really thought about that. Do we really want this company in the world? So I do think it is something that there's more attention being played to at this point. I think it's very important. So um, any other comments, or should we move on to another topic? I would just say, with regard to the mall, when you meet a young company, ask them about their idea about monopoly. Because, Shana, you were saying before about winner-take-all dynamics or, or, or yeah. zero-sum dynamics. A lot of people think that the only reason to start companies is for that company to become a monopoly. And that's a philosophy that's espoused by a lot of very famous people that are now advisors to the White House. The question is, how do you play around with new forms, I'm serious, new forms of ownership? We have cooperative models that have existed for 200 years. In the Bay Area where I live, this is the cutting edge thing. It's not what you do, what technology you're doing. What is the ownership structure such that you have more resilience as an organization and all the stakeholders are aligned? Look at the uh, B Corp movement. Not all B Corps are co-ops, but many of them are co-ops. Find the alignment between those two counterparties. You're going to have an organization that is internally much more transparent in its communication and does better in the long run, also ha tends to have better female leadership, diversity, and whatnot. So it isn't just about the technology. It's about how you're sharing in the ownership of the city and the ownership of the organization that operates in the city. So you all are, are in a great vantage point where you see some of the um, newest and latest innovations and in technology. So what is there anything that you'd like to bring up? Maybe you funded, not funded, but just what is something out there that really moved you and you said, wow, this is, this is going to be big and this is going to have great implications? Because we all hear about the pile on companies and the same, you know, another dating app or another, you know, whatever. Um, but have you seen anything that you would say, wow? this is breakout technology, or this is a breakout company that's going to change the world significantly? I mean, from my perspective, when you find a founder who really f feels a vision very deeply, and you know, it's really not about what I think or my ideas, even the last discussion, it's not, it's not really about my point of view. It's, if you can find a founder who has a vision of how the future should be, with their product in it. You know, much of the time, if they're that thoughtful, they're thinking about the impact that product has and they're actually doing something that's you know, very genuine to them. And a lot of times, the, the generational changes that yield those kinds of ideas are very hard to separate from the rest of the stuff out there. So personally, I do love to find people who have a very clear vision of the future and their product in it and, it, and something that relates to them, so much so that you may not even understand that how new that idea is, because it relates to them and they grew up in a, a time. So right now, for example, you know, anybody who's like 44 or over, there, there was like 1% of 1% of people that grew up engineering. Anybody who's 34, you know, was a little bit bigger, but still pretty rare. Now, you know, you have kids growing up coding and now going to grad school and studying something totally different and bringing the engineering perspective to that science, if, if it's biology or city planning or, or, or you just have more people doing it. So I think that those realities are going to yield a whole new set of interesting companies and problems that there's a generational change happening there, and you don't even, it's, you, you, sometimes you can't even see it when you're in it. You have to maybe see it in retrospect to understand it. So those are when I really find innovative ideas. It has nothing to do with me. It just has to do with the way someone grew up and their vision. But you're asking for specific examples. 
Yeah, if you have a specific example oh, I'm of something you I'm in love with so many companies. I mean, I'll give you, say, four quick examples. Uh, there's a company at DesignX at MIT that I'm involved with. It's called Biobot, and they're throwing robots up sewer systems in order to do real-time analysis of human waste. Sounds a little gross, but if you want to know how a city is digesting, if you want to know how the food system works, if you want to know how people are feeling, our emotion gets encoded in our waste. The way that we synthesize food and vitamins gets encoded in our waste. It's a highly granular form of data, but it's the kind of data that can help us make decisions as, as a people. We're gonna, and it's not nearly as invasive as, as the data that your cell phone right now is pouring into the cloud. It really isn't. It's much more viable data. Lots of cities are already using that. This is a company that is gonna be absolutely game changing. Josephine is a food company. It turns home kitchens into restaurants. Go to somebody's house, have a meal there, or put it into a takeout box and have them learn about their neighbor and, and develop really intimate social capital connections with their neighbors based upon the food that they make. Another one is called Neighborly. This is not an endorsement of any of these companies, nor is it an indication of how well the companies are doing, but conceptually, by the way. Neighborly takes the multi-trillion dollar municipal bond market and asks people in local markets to use their investing dollars to make investment returns on bonds that relate to products and projects that are happening locally to them. And then finally, there's a basket of companies, I'll just name one from a former mentor of mine uh, called Ginger.io, but it uses the um, what's called inference data on your phone in order to make conclusions about how you're feeling. It's the kind of data that just by having your phone with you and it sees how you move around, it can start to make predictions if you're going to get Alzheimer's or dementia, for example. So we're getting some super early indications. And that actually helps with regard to infrastructure deployment. So you saw, for example, that after people erased the Uber app from their iPhones, Uber still had a cookie on the phones that was following them around. If you guys didn't see that story, check it out. Why was that interesting? Well, of course, yeah, Uber's creepy, but more interesting is what they realize is that to make their demand predictions to get a customer experience that's helpful to them, which is like a car suddenly manifests when you need a ride, they need to be creating predictive models about where people are and where people are going to be. But those same models can be used for everything. Where should public restrooms be? Where should, where should, that wasn't me. Where should city bikes be? Where should urban infrastructure be? And the more proximity that you get, the more return on investment you get for the kind of density that Sean was talking about. So there's just a few examples, and if you want to talk later, I'll give you more. One, Susan. Just one other area that I feel pretty passionate about now, and it's on everyone's mind, is sort of healthcare in general, and what sort of trends are shaping that industry. Um, you know, obviously it's a massive industry, and there's a lot of efficiencies that could be had. Um, it's usually light years behind every other industry when it comes to tech innovation. And, um, you know, that's just an area, if you think about telehealth and where that industry is moving, that we're pretty passionate about. And um, just how, um, how many inefficiencies at the hospital level, down to the provider level, down to the patient level, um, and how, you know, human error, for instance, and by leveraging technology, you're going to be able to minimize that and save massive amounts of money. You know, keeping people out of the ER is, is another way, you know, medication adherence, medication management. A, there's a lot of opportunity within this industry, and it's just an area that is one of our, our themes and research areas at Catalyst that we're really passionate about and we hope to do more in. So, Shauna, have you, um, when you think about um, where the world is going, and you've been in the venture field for quite some time, it seems as if the rate of change is going faster and faster, and when you meet these visionary entrepreneurs, how do you choose one over the other? I mean, I gravitate to some very out there people. So you can't fake that. You either are or you aren't. So I've, I've found that the really genuine, visionary people that are really not affected by the rest of the market are the ones that personally I gravitate to. Yeah. Um, but you know, the internet itself and technology is a blood sport. So the higher and more successful you get, the more competitive it is. And so you need um, not only to have that, that vision, but, and often the vision brings this, but there's a sort of um, definitely a walk through walls mentality. And I find that I, I like to go back to their childhood and learn about who they were to understand who they are. And there's some things that, you know, I just don't think it's easy to fake the stuff that I look for personally. So I've developed a lot of psychological profiles that I look for. 
and um, you know, I'm pretty diligent about, about assessing them. I don't only fund those types of, of people that meet the profile I'm looking for, um, yeah. but I do like to understand what I'm dealing with by understanding people's psychology. Okay, so um, we have about five minutes left. So um, let's talk for a minute about unintended consequences. So, so much of innovation is being created in kind of a silo, in a place here and there, or um, somewhat of a vacuum. And when new technologies come out, sometimes there are unintended consequences. And I just think to sidewalk labs in New York City and these kiosks that you see on a lot of the street corners that provide internet access pretty much anywhere. And what's been happening, there's a great number of homeless people who have found those kiosks and are hooking up their phones or just watching on the screen, watching movies all day. And I'm sure that was not one of the use cases that sidewalks, sidewalk labs thought about. And we frequently see that because things are being created, really good products and innovations, in, in sort of one area, and then they're introduced into the real world, and all of a sudden, you know, there, there, there are these unintended consequences. So, can you, you want to talk about that? Just anything you've seen along the way, and 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 how do you think about that when you're funding companies? Obviously, you can't see the future, and you can't know every use case, and but but like, how do you how do you really um, look at that when you when you invest in a company? Unintended. I mean, I, I probably have something that's more funny than serious, but um, I, you know, I think if it, 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 in in general we try and think about if there's a negative sort of byproduct of something happening, that we would at least be able to talk through that with founders and see if we could course correct. I think we um, try to be thoughtful about that, but I, I, in general, I just think we can't see the future. We sort of pick the destination that we hope we get to. But we, in, in most of the really good companies that I've worked with, it's, uh, you know, it's like there's a graphic of, you know, if you start here and you hope you get up there, what is the actual path? What else? It's a little bit like that, and you get to the end point. And that's just, that's exactly how every company is, exactly that path. Um, so we had a company, again, with one wheel skateboard, um, very excited about it, because it's last mile transportation, designed for urban environments. What is everyone doing with it? They ride it down single track mountain bike trails on mountains. That is the thing that everyone decided this is good for. It's 10,000 plus people doing that. And it was definitely not what we thought about when we invested. So I, I just, yeah. I mean, I think we eventually hope you course correct and get back there. Um, and then on negative things, uh, you know, I think you, you're making a bet ultimately on a founder, right? You, you, if they believe in getting to a certain point, the really good ones will say, look, it's not working, or I'm really uncomfortable with some of the things that I've created, and um, hopefully you fix it we that want, way. We want unintended consequences. Entrepreneurs should be like emergency medical service personnel who can rescue any person from any injury. And they should be especially sensitized to the accident. And innovation comes from accident. There's a great book by a professor named Eric Von Hippel at MIT. It's about open innovation. It's about how kite surfing and skateboarding and all the things that we think are so incredibly cool came from people fiddling with something that was absolutely unintended. There's a guy, Paul Virilio. His entire oeuvre is about every new technology creates a new form of accident. And that accident then creates a new form of technology. So there is this kind of like chicken and egg game with regard to, with regard to accident. And just to pick up on what you're saying about the psychological profile, we're looking for somebody who is absolutely rigid, but absolutely flexible. Because they, we want them to be so flexible that when they see that the accident that they've produced is actually a bigger opportunity than the company that they actually intended to start, we want them to go after that. We're not the people who are like, no, 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 you didn't, you're not doing that. You said you were doing something different. We want them to be searching for the global max. And that's really all entrepreneurship is. It's a vehicle by which we can discover maximum opportunity as entrepreneurs. I think venture is so random, you know, and that's why it's, if, if you're a founder, if you're an entrepreneur and people are passing and you just got to know nobody knows anything. So the, even the ones that know a lot, they would never screw up and that's just not the case. So I think from my perspective, when I invest in a company that ends up very successful, I consider myself lucky I'm in that company as opposed to whatever I saw. So I do like... Um, to remember that. 
And I think that founders should remember that. Um, and th that's kind of the biggest, best part. So the last um, quick comment is um, obviously entrepreneurs and good ideas are everywhere in every sector and every kind of uh, profile. What about investors? Obviously, it's a small number of people that are controlling a massive amount of capital that's flowing to companies. There's something like only 200 some odd venture firms in the US alone, and last year they deployed 69 billion of capital. So, you know, obviously there's a lot going on to open up the world for entrepreneurs and ideas, but what about the investors? How do we get more people who have the means, maybe can't get into a fund because the minimum in, in the great funds is usually a million dollars, but how do we also enable and engage new investors who should be part of the wealth creation that's happening on a massive scale? Don't start by investing money. Start by investing time, and then start investing your heart, and then start investing more in your expertise, and only then start investing money. That's kind of the first part. And I think that there's a really well-known playbook by which you can become a financial investor. The second thing is be very, very careful with crowdfunding. There's a lot of people out there talking about crowdfunding mechanisms as being a way that you can get small amounts of money and high return deals, but there's very little transparency with regard to the diligence process, and entrepreneurs generally don't have time for people who are putting in $500 here and there. So just be very, very careful. I'm not saying don't do it, but just be incredibly careful. And ask around. If you want to get into it, feel free to start a community of people where you're asking each other all the time, hey, what do you think about this deal? What if we combined efforts in order to learn more about this kind of company? Uh, and then finally, reach out to professional investors. Good investors want to share what they know because they want to share in the industry and they want to share in the community. So do reach out. Well, great. We are out of time. I do know there's an app. So if you would like to connect with any of the panelists, please do so on your app or reach out to them at the end of this. So thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, the next session in this room will be promptly at 1.15 p.m. It'll be on training tech talent at 1.15 on this stage. Thank you. <laughs>